people, I'm sorry, I got to get a little bit serious here, but you may not know this. There is another mob war going on, and it's very intense. You may not know it, and somebody's going to come out a winner. Somebody's going to come out a loser. A lot of people are going to be affected by it, I can tell you right now. I'm going to divulge this right now. It's something that I've been holding, but I think it's time. There's a scene that depicts that. Don't get too nervous. Don't get too scared. There might be something we can do about it. That's very, very possible, but it's taking place, and it's happening right now. And this is very realistic, and it's happening in real time. So I'm sorry. I don't mean to be offensive. Don't get too nervous about it. Just Brace yourself, and here it is. Hey everyone, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. All is blessed on this end and as always we give God all the praise, honor and glory for that. As you can see, I'm still in my London studio in my hotel room. But always we got to keep up trying to give you the best possible content we can. Thank you for subscribing. Past 900,000 on a march to a million. Thanks to all of you enjoying the content. We really appreciate that. We mean it. Just an announcement because I've been getting so many messages on Francis Wine. We are now available to ship in 41 states. 41 states. We finally got licensed and approval and distribution for all of them. Very excited. So franziswine.com. Go on there now for all of you that have been asking me and asking me and asking me. And people, let me tell you something. Yes, we're promoting wine. It's great. But understand something. I don't expect you to get drunk. We don't want you to do that. You know, there's a difference with wine. Why is it on every restaurant menu, every high-end restaurant, they pair a wine with you? Wine is relaxing. You enjoy it with a meal. You sit down. Back in the day, whenever we had a sit down, there was a bottle of wine there in case tensions got crazy. We had a glass of wine to relax things and uh, and just calm things down. So please, I hope you see it that way. You know, we're not promoting anything else but an enjoyable, relaxing evening and something to pair a great dinner with. You sit around with friends, you, you talk, you enjoy. It's, it's different. And that's how I always viewed wine my whole life. So 41 states, franciswine.com. Put your order in if you want some. We appreciate it very much. And yes, we will be in the United Kingdom within the next couple of months, certainly by the end of the year, working it out now, licensing and distribution. We're getting it done first the UK and then prayerfully all over Europe and all over the United States. So today, very, very interesting happened to me in our Q&A in Bristol. We always do a Q&A after the speaking engagement. People love it. They ask me anything that they want. And I, of course, respond as best I could. You know, I tease in the United States. I say, if I don't want to answer, I know how to take the fifth. I've done that many times. We don't do that here. They don't know what the fifth is. But anyway, I answer most every question that I could, and they're all good. A lot of them really good. And somebody asked me this question. He said, Michael, you've seen all the great mob movies. And I said, sure, I have. He said, off the top of your head, without really thinking about it, without doing any research, what are the most memorable scenes, the scenes that you really remember the most? And I thought about it for 10 seconds. And they all popped into my head because they're all so memorable. A lot of them were so realistic that it really brought me back to the day, back to my time in that life. And I want to go through them. There's, uh, there's seven of them. There's actually eight of them that I want to go through that, that I thought about right away. And the last one is very intense. I can tell you that, but we'll get to that. And they're in no particular order, uh, really, but they're just, you know, ones that popped into my head. How about you? Without even thinking right now, all of you that have seen the mob movies, what are the most memorable scenes in all of those movies? I bet you they're different for almost everybody. For me, they might be a little different because I've lived that life and I've actually experienced some of the things that were so well portrayed in the movies. But let me tell you this, my number one favorite scene of all time, the most intense, probably the best acted, the most realistic, the one that just gave you goosebumps, the one that I remembered because this was reality. This was real Cosa Nostra life. And that was in, of course, you've heard me say this many times, one of my favorite, if not my favorite movie, the HBO Gotti movie produced or released, I should say, in 1996. Armand DeSante, Anthony Quinn, Vin Pastore, a whole great cast of, of people. But this scene was so dynamic, so memorable, 
and so real. And that was when Anthony Quinn, if you remember, he had had a sit down with uh, Carlo Gambino over John Gotti killing a made guy in another man's crew, Paulie Castellano's crew. And Paulie Castellano wanted Gotti to be killed. He asked Carlo Gambino to have him killed. Rightfully so. I mean, he could have done that. You don't kill a made man. You don't ever raise your hand to a made man. So Castellano had every right to do that. But Neil Delacroach, he loved John Gotti. He fought. That was a great scene. But the scene that followed was dynamic, intense, even better. And that's when Anthony Quinn, Neil Delacroach, walks into the bar where Gotti is and says, I want to see you. And basically says, I've been fighting for your life all night. And some of the words that he said and the way he delivered it was so intense and so real, so real. He looked at Gotti after a while and he said, and I'm not going to repeat it word for word, but almost word for word, not go over the whole scene, but almost word for word. He said, you know, I clipped a lot of guys in my life, close friends, guys I didn't know, and I didn't always agree. He said, I didn't always agree, but I never questioned the orders. I never question the orders. So true in that life. Sometimes you got to clip people that are your friends. They make a mistake. They violate policy, something very serious. Your best friend walks you into a room. You don't walk out again. And then there's some guys you're just given an assignment. You don't even know. You just do it. But what did he say? I never question the order. And he said, if Don Carlo had said, you got to go, then I would have came here today with these two zips and you would go. Just like that. Imagine that. He loved Gotti, loved him. But if he got an order that said that Gotti had to go, he told him straight out, I'd come here with these two zips and you would go. He said, John, you cannot whack a made man in another man's crew. You can't do it. You cannot whack a made man from someone else's crew. And then he said, there are rules. There are rules. You break the rules and this whole thing of ours cracks and crumbles. And you know what? What's happening today? What's happening? From the 80s on, a lot of people breaking the rules. I understand. I was one of them. Be honest with you. I betrayed Omerta. I'll say it again. I don't care who knocks me at this point. I didn't put people in prison. I did my dance the way I did it, manipulated a little bit, paid the price after it, spent three years in the hole. Government was mad at me. Didn't put anybody in prison. Call me whatever you want. But yes, I broke the rules. And so did a lot of other guys. And what's happening? Crumbling. It's not like it was before. No way. I always say the golden years of the mafia, Cosa Nostra in America, from the 1950s through the mid-80s when the racketeering laws came in and everything started to fall apart. That was it. But that scene was so intense. And then he looked at Gotti and he said, you never break the rules. And he said it with such conviction. It was a scary scene. It kind of got to me. It brought me right back. You know, when you relate to something and you see it portrayed so well on the screen, whether it be in a movie or television, it gets to you. And yes, that one got to me. Brilliantly acted. You know, if I had to rate it, I, I would probably say that was number one. And I really mean that. And I'm on the Santi. I mean, come on. If you haven't seen that movie, I've been saying this for years. Go on YouTube. You can watch it. It's, it doesn't cost you anything. But it was brilliantly done. Anthony Quinn, dynamic as Neil Delacroach. And Armand DeSanti, he played Gotti better than Gotti played himself. He did him more justice than you could imagine. So that would be my number one. Came right to mind immediately. I didn't have to think twice. The next scene that came right to mind was from Donnie Brasco. And I've said this before. I think this was Al Pacino's best gangster role. Of course, he was terrific in Scarface. Whole different thing. That wasn't Cousin Oster. It was drugs. It was cartels. But as far as a mob movie, I think he was better than he was in The Godfather. I mean that. And I knew Lefty Guns, Lefty Ruggiero. You know, I wouldn't say he mirrored him, but he played the role so magnificently. And the dialogue that he spoke, he delivered the lines so well. And the lines were so authentic. And there was one scene, if you remember, when uh, he and Donnie Brasco were in the car and they were driving over the bridge. And he was upset. Lefty was upset. Pacino was upset because he was sent for. And as he's driving, He's talking to uh, Donnie Brasco and he's saying, you know, look at me. He said, when Sonny Black went to jail, he said, I was the best guy there. He said, every week, week in and week out, 200 fuzzles. He says, I paid to his family. I see, he says, I paid to his mistress. He said, I paid to the mistress to the mistress. And he was kind of complaining, but the way he delivered those lines was so authentic and so real. It was unbelievable. 
And then he says to Donnie, who's trying to understand him, he says, I got sent for. Do you know what that means? I got sent for. And Donnie says, well, Sonny Red sent for you? And he said, did I say Sonny Red? Sonny Black. Sonny Black sent for me. And the way he said it again, the way he delivered those lines was unbelievable. And then uh, when he said to Donnie, he said, hey, Donnie, you want to kill me with that draft? Shut the window. You want to kill me with that draft? That brought back memories because I've told this before, but I got to mention it again. I used to drive in when I was a recruit. I had a, a car agency, so I always had a good car. And I used to drive my cars in, a Cadillac, a Lincoln, whatever I had, I would drive it in. And because I always had a nice car, the boss, Tom DeBella, and Andy Russo, my cop of regime, would make me drive them, except I didn't drive. I had to sit in the back and they drove. And both of them smoked. And they wouldn't let me open the window. And I didn't smoke. I was choking in the back. So I rolled down the window. And I said, hey, you're closing the draft. Shut the window. So when he said that, I think I was the only one in the movie theater that really laughed. I mean, I, I cracked up because it was so realistic. And, and Pacino delivered those lines so beautifully. And then he says something that's really intense. He said, I've been sent for. In our thing, you'll go in alive and you'll come out dead. And it's your best friend that does it. And the way he said it, man, listen, I spent 20 years in that life. And unfortunately, that's one of the horrors of that life. You make a mistake, you don't know it. Your best friend walks you into a room, you don't walk out again. And I told all of you in another video, I'm not going to be redundant. I had that experience where I was walked into a room. I didn't know if I was going to walk out again. And I'm telling you right now, I don't care. I don't mind admitting it. I was scared. It's a scary situation when you think you're going to die or you're going to meet your maker. It's scary. So I've experienced that. And in 20 years, obviously, I've known situations where guys were walked into a room and they didn't walk out again. But that scene was magnificent, brilliantly, brilliantly acted. Uh, the dialogue was terrific. Pacino did an ace job. Was it number two? Could be. Right up there. Terrific. The next scene, in intensity and so well acted and portrayed, and let me be clear, I mean, all of these actors do a brilliant job throughout all of the films, but some of these scenes, again, off the top of my head, just stood out. I'm going to ask you to do the same in the comments. Tell me, off the top of the head, which are the best scenes that you remember, without looking, without thinking, just saying it, because they stuck, they're indelible in your mind and your thoughts. Casino. Do you remember when Joe Pesci was upset with Robert De Niro and they had a meet and because of surveillance, where were they meeting? In the middle of the desert because they didn't want to be seen with one another. Actually, De Niro didn't want to be seen with Pesci because of the heat that he was bringing on. And uh, you see, De Niro was talking. He said, listen, I don't know. My chances of 50-50 are coming out of this. He said he knew that Pesci was going to be upset, Spalatro. So uh, Pesci drives up. You see the dust going, middle of the desert, he gets out of the car and he's all upset and he goes off on him and he starts to use profanity. You know, I don't do this on this channel. He basically says, you complaining about me? You go up to the bosses and you complain about me? And De Niro says, I wasn't complaining, I'm just telling the truth, you're bringing a lot of heat. And the, one of the lines that he delivers was so, he said to him, you personally don't exist without me. I'm what matters here. And I got to tell you something, a lot of guys believe that. They carry that on their chest. You don't exist, I'm what matters. But the way he delivered the lines was unbelievable. It was just such an intense scene. And uh, again, very realistic. Guys act like that, guys talk like that. That's part of the life. You have that kind of bravado. You know, maybe it's a kind of arrogance. But uh, when you're a made guy and you're speaking to a guy that's not made, but that's with you, you can come off pretty intense at some, at some points in time. You know, that was just a brilliant scene. So again, off the top of my head, I just started rattling it off in, in answers to this question. And everybody was like, wow, yeah, okay, I remember that. There was a lot of people in the room. It was a big event. And uh, people were getting off on it. So again, going to ask you to do the same thing. Off the top of your head. Another very intense scene in The Godfather. When Don Corleone, if you remember, is at the commission meeting. It wasn't really a commission meeting. It was more guys there than there normally would be at a commission meeting. But he's at a commission meeting. They're trying to settle the dispute. Remember, Sonny had been killed at the toll booth, and one of the other boss's kid was killed, and now they were trying to settle this war, and it all started with Salozzo. And so they talk about it, and they're settling it, and then Don Corleone, Marlon Brando, brilliantly gets up and delivers these lines, something to this effect. He said, I got to bring my youngest boy, Michael, home over this Salozzo business. He said, and I'm concerned, basically, and I'm paraphrasing it. He said, I'm going to bring him back here, but if he should get accidentally shot by a police officer, or he should accidentally hang himself in the cell, or he should get hit by a bolt of lightning, then I'm going to blame some people in this room, and I will not forgive. The way he said it was just amazing, and I guess 
the family thing got me, you know. But so true, and he delivered it like a real boss. I mean, he had such dignity as a boss in that role. I mean, honestly, every mob boss should act like that. The guy had class, he had dignity, he exhumed power, he had control. And that's why so many guys, after watching The Godfather, actually started to try to imitate him. And Michael. Michael kind of acted the same way. He didn't really lose his temper. I mean, it was two times when both of them lost their temper, if you remember. Don Corleone lost his temper when he was talking to the singer, remember? And he said, you can act like a man, and he smacked him in the face, and he kind of lost it a little bit because he didn't like to see that weakness. And then Al Pacino, when he got very, very upset, a couple of times, I think, once he smacked his wife because uh, she told him that she had had an abortion. He was very upset about that. I think one other time he was mad in another scene because they shot at his family in the house and he really blew up over it. But other than that, they really kept their control. That's the way a mob boss should be, should act just like that. So again, another very intense scene that, boom, popped right into my head. Next, popped right into my head from a Bronx tale. The very famous line in the bar, in Sonny's bar, what was it? Now you can't leave. And the way he delivered that, and then the dialogue that followed, you know, that everybody, you saw the look on their faces, they knew they made a mistake after they got rowdy in the bar and started, you know, throwing the beer bottles around and glasses. And then what followed after that was just great. And let me tell you something, mob guys were no slouches in that regard, honestly. They would have busted those guys up. And yeah, they might have been Hells Angels or bikers. Nobody's going to back down. They came out with the baseball bats and boom, they went to work on it. And it was just a great scene. Then he went out there, and I love at the end when Sonny said, he picked up the guy's head and he said, look at me, remember who did this to you. And I think this was, uh, without a doubt, Chaz's best role. He's brilliant in everything that he does, but I loved him as Sonny in this film. He was brilliant, and just always remember that. Now you just can't leave. Brilliant. Now another scene came right into my head again from the Bronx Tale. You got to remember this. They're playing, they're shooting craps, I should say, in the basement. Remember? Hilarious scene, beautifully done. I tell you, you know, Chaz is a brilliant writer, and he's a, he has a good feel for the street because this was very authentic. There was a lot of crap games going on in different places, and guys were just like this. I don't think you know this, but a lot of mob guys are very funny. They got a dry sense of humor. They don't realize they're funny, but they're very funny. Back in the day, we had more laughs than you can imagine. I told you about Frankie G. Andrew Russo was funny. Even Sally Machoto, who later became an informer, tried to put me in trouble, but he was funny. Every time I was around him, I would laugh. A lot of guys were so funny, dry humor. They didn't even know it. And this scene kind of exemplified that. Sonny didn't mean to be funny, but come on, if you were standing there watching this like we were in the movie, you got to laugh. I mean, this was hilarious. So remember that one scene uh, with the jinx? First one that goes into the bathroom. No, you're a jinx. I don't want your money touching my money. Put him in the bathroom. <laughs> and they take him and they put him in the bathroom and he's complaining all the way. Oh, Sonny, come on now. Put him in the bathroom. Just like that, right? And then, you know, he's, uh, uh, he's moving. They're going to shoot the dice again. Colosio is. And then what happens? The whale, right? He's behind him and he's breathing over him. He's intense. And he said, stop breathing on me. We stop. Put him in the bathroom. And now the whale's got to go in the bathroom. And the bathroom is small. I don't care. Put him in the bathroom. He puts him in the bathroom, right? Then they go to, to shoot again. And what happens? Coffee cake. The pocked up face, remember? He said, wait, stop. I don't want that face looking at those dice when he's ready to put him in the bathroom. But to the whale is in there, there's no room. I don't give a F. Put him in the bathroom. And they take coffee cake and they stuff all three of them in the bathroom. What a scene. Jazz brilliantly written. I don't know where he got it from. I guess he might have, you know, uh, been in one of those crap games. I don't know. But if not, it was so authentic. Brilliant job. Chaz is a brilliant, brilliant writer. I got to tell you, when it comes to this kind of stuff, just about anything. But that was a brilliant scene. And uh, man, I loved it. I really did. So those scenes, I rattled them off. There were seven of them. I rattled them off right off the top of my head. And uh, man, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree? Do you have another scene? Did I miss anything? But remember, those were close to home because they were so authentic. I can remember being in every one of those situations. Authenticity means a lot to me in these movies. The actors were brilliant. The script writing was brilliant. The dialogue in those scenes was so realistic. There's more. I mean, I can go through a lot, but these just stood out right off the top of my head. Now I have one more. And people, I'm sorry, I got to get a little bit serious here, but you may not know this. There is another mob war going on, and it's very intense. You may not know it. 
And somebody's going to come out a winner. Somebody's going to come out a loser. A lot of people are going to be affected by it. I can tell you right now. I'm going to divulge this right now. It's something that I've been holding, but I think it's time. And uh, there's a scene that depicts that. I'm going to show it to you now. Don't get too nervous. Don't get too scared. Um, there might be something we can do about it. That's very, very possible. But it's taking place, and uh, it's happening right now. And this is very realistic, and it's happening in real time. So I'm sorry. I don't mean to be offensive. Don't get too nervous about it. Just brace yourself. And here it is. Now you scared me. So there it is. Am I correct? So who do you think would win? Would it be the Republicans, Trump leading the way? Or would it be Biden and his merry crew of uh, people? Who do you think would win? <laughs> I'm not going to give you my opinion. I think you know where I stand on that. But hey, this is a battle for the soul of America. So anyway, we've got to have a little fun with all of these things. Don't take it too seriously. Uh, but I will tell you, go to the voting booths in November and do the job. Do the right thing. And I think you all know what the right thing is at this point in time. I'll leave it at that. So that's it for today, my friends. How do I always leave you the same exact way? Because being here in the United Kingdom, in London, I still watch the news every day from the United States. I know what's going on. Got my kids back there. Of course, I'm always concerned. Violence and all of that. Ladies, be safe. Watch your surroundings. That's all I can tell you. Too many things going on. New York, California, everywhere in between. Be careful, ladies. Guys, too. I don't mean to pick out the ladies, but hey, that's who I am. I'm protective in that regard. Be healthy. Do the best you can. People have been commenting that I'm looking good. It's because my family keeps me in shape. I have no choice. I got to work out. Got to eat right. Got to do it. I'm getting up there. 71 years old. If I don't start now, when am I going to start? Trying to stretch this life out as best I could. Be safe. Be healthy. And I really do mean this from the bottom of my heart. God bless all of you. And I mean that. I'm sincere when I say that. I don't say it lightly. Be safe. Be healthy. God bless you. And yes, I'll see you next time. Take care.